you, you can hold those for later. That's okay. I like them at the end. Like, I know you don't really mean, I mean, it's nice, but it doesn't really count as much for later. But thank you. Um, I'm Steve. This is me. You're supposed to have Grant, but Grant's lazy. So we, I'm doing his talk instead. Uh, and also, he's given like three talks, so we thought it might be boring if people saw Grant over and over again. Uh, exactly. <coughs> Uh, I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance for sneezing or coughing. I'm getting over. Still my name on the feedback, so great feedback for this stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is me on Twitter, IRC, and on GitHub. Right? That's a zero because I'm leet like that. Uh, as an incentive for people to ask questions, I've got the best swag of the show. Great for opening lemonade. Four gigabyte bottle op USB bottle opener, and it's metal, so it really opens bottles. Okay? Yes. All right, so we're gonna talk about scaling now, and then I'm gonna be also teaching the workshop this afternoon. So if you hate my presentation style, you can just skip right out of the workshop, but if you enjoy it, stay for the workshop this afternoon. All right, so the agenda for today is learn a little bit about platform as a service. How many of you have used a platform as a service? How many actually know what it is? For sure, like really used it, and don't think like, oh. Yeah, okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about scaling, and then I'm gonna show you a demo of OpenShift scaling up an app. Okay? So the assumptions, this is really hard. I hope everybody, you can write web code or you're a DevOps person. Does that fit everybody here? Because otherwise you might be lost. And you can use command line. You don't really have to use Git and you understand SSH. Everybody got that? Okay, good. So before we go on to everything else, I want to make sure everybody recognizes today. It is Star Wars Day. That is the most important part of the talk. May the fourth be with you. Did you ever see this video of the people, put, it's like a guy has an at-at that he uses like a dog, right? Like it's his little at-at and so they, it's a, it's a f hilarious video. Find it. <laughs> okay, <coughs> so now on to uh, platform as a service. I know EC2, I totally know about the cloud. No. So we're gonna discuss some party trivia. IAS stands for infrastructure as a service, right? And this is Amazon EC2. What's another example of that? Linode, Azure, right? What it is is you ask for a server. It's infrastructure. You say, I want this much memory, this much um, CPU power, this much disk space, and they give it to you. And then you're responsible for the OS, you're responsible for configuring it, you're responsible for DNS, you're responsible for keeping it up to date. Not only are you responsible, but you can configure that stuff, right? So it's much more configurable, but you have to do a lot more work. What software is a service? What's the biggest example in the world? Gmail. Gmail is by far the biggest uh, software as a service. What's another one that's very popular with enterprise companies or enterprises? NetSuite, 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 Salesforce, right? So every time some company says, oh, I don't want to put my data in the cloud, ask them if they use Salesforce and how much proprietary, important financial information they're actually already putting in the cloud. So that, how exciting is that as a developer, though, software as a service? Not very, right? It's nice that you have your mail working, but you can't really write against it. Infrastructure as a service is kind of a pain for developers because you actually have to still manage your own servers. What platform as a service is, is you do a command and we spin up an app server and you're good to go. What are some other examples of, I, I don't want this to be a complete propaganda talk, so we're gonna talk about other platforms as a service. Who's some others in here? So would that include an entire LAMP stack? Yes. You'll see an entire, like, I have a, I'm going to spin up an entire, well, I won't spin it up, I'll show you the command to spin up an entire Python plus Mongo with code running in one command, right? What's another, who else is in this space for those who raised their hand that said they'd used platform as a service before? Heroku. Heroku, yes, that's probably the biggest online provider in this space. Who else? Oh, that's right, he's, you're right. God, think, you, good thing, good thing they had taken over. Good thing for Grant. Here you go. All right, who's another? Cloudbees, who said Cloudbees? But we hate them, so you're, gonna, you're, on, you're on probation there, so be careful. Google App Engine, why don't we like Google App Engine as developers, though? Because you're stuck on them? Yes, because they use proprietary libraries. So. We're open source on the whole stack, and I'll get to that in a minute. Oh, you already got a key. You don't get any more. <laughs> okay, wait. So you're all done with this, right? You understand the different pieces of the stack? So even if you learn nothing else today, next time someone says, oh, we got to move it to the cloud, what's your first question going to be? 
which part of the cloud, right? Cloud is really big. We're going to talk about a lot of big amorphous things. Cloud's pretty amorphous. This helps you break it down. This also really works at parties when you're trying to introduce to yourself to somebody like, hey, do you know what infrastructure as a service stands for? <laughs> Now you know why I'm divorced. Okay, um, one source to bind them all. We are an open source project, right? So OpenShift is from Red Hat. And what does Red Hat do? Open source products, right? So OpenShift Origins is our upstream for both our online service, which you're gonna see today, and what else does Red Hat always do? Sells into the enterprise. So we have an enterprise version, right? But the key to it is our open source version. So if you go to openshift.github.io, there's all the source code for everything we're running today. And we love pull requests for anything. Documentation, if you're a Ruby developer, the whole platform is written in Ruby. If you want to write a cartridge for your favorite language, and I'll explain that in a minute, you can do that as well. Any questions? Okay, propaganda, I've got a few more slides of propaganda and then we'll move on, okay? Yeah? I hope you're learning something. This is the stack. Our online service runs on East. We're running on top of RHEL, and I'll explain later why we need RHEL here, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Out of the box, you get Tomcat, Apache. Is it shaking for everybody else every time I touch it? Yeah. Okay. It's not so much that as it is the air conditioning that's causing the projector to. Oh, to shake? Nice. If, I'm from California, though, so like I feel like I should like stop, duck, and cover. I would say you would have been right at home with it. <laughs> no, we, yeah, that's a sign of an earthquake. And we also, instead of cloud bees, if you really need JEE, -E, you can actually run on top of us because we've got JBoss running there, both EAP and AS. For backends, we've got PostgreSQL, Mongo, and MySQL. So those all, these all come out of the box. But we can also run custom cartridges. So that a cartridge is what you use to add functionality to your gear, which you can think of like a server. So a gear is like a server, and you take cartridges and you slot cartridges into your gear to make it do stuff. So these are all cartridges. You can do your own. I wrote a Minecraft one. Right, so you can basically run Minecraft on top of us because it's just a Java jar and it just runs on us no problem. But we also have people running COBOL or Fortran or Couchbase or Memcache. Right, if we don't have one out of the box, you can add it. These are the languages you get out of the box. How many of you are Python developers? No Python developers. How about Java? You gotta put your hand up for that one. Mostly Java. PHP. We also have Zen Server here. So if you've never played with Zen Server and you wanna play with Zen Server, not Zen Framework, you can use it here too. Node. Cool kids. Ruby. No Ruby developers either. Interesting crowd. Pearl. Come on. Yes. Oh, I'm giving you another USB stick for raising, being brave enough to raise your hand that you still do Pearl. You get a second one, but that's just like over the top. Does the Pearl include Mod Pearl in Apache? Yes. Yes. When you spin up Pearl, we're spinning up Apache with Mod Pearl on it for you. Okay. Um, because we're open source and this is standard languages, you get all the frameworks you want. How many of you are doing test-driven development? or continuous integration, we have Jenkins out of the box if you want to keep doing that. We have great Eclipse, how many of you use Eclipse? So we have great Eclipse integration. It's actually better than our command line stuff. All right, and then we also have package apps, like you can start up WordPress and... Okay, I'm kind of getting tired of propaganda. Can we move faster? Is that okay? All right, so I think of this as awesome sauce. So whether you use us or not, as a developer, you need to learn platform as a service. Okay, it is coming, right? Get we all were like, oh, well, I can just keep using Subversion. Git's here, right? And Git will be the source control that everybody will be using for most cases in the future. So learn Git. Okay, NoSQL, it's coming, right? You may not use it in every single application, but some type of NoSQL data store you're going to be using in the future. It's just, that's just how it is. Platform as a service for developers is coming. Whether it's us or somebody else, you will be using platform as a service within the next three to five years inside your company, probably even less. So learn it. Play with it, use us. If you want, use some other one. It's all, and once you use it, you never want to go back. Because it is awesome. Like, I, it's very easy for me to be an evangelist for this project because it's so awesome. Okay, well wait, last propaganda slide. There's more. Three knives, and it's free with no time limit. So we have a free tier, we're committed to that free tier. That free tier gives you three gears. Again, like servers. Each is 512 megs of RAM and one gigabyte of disk space. Okay, and you can destroy and create, destroy and create. You can have three running concurrently. And if you can run your business inside of one of these gears, it's free forever. So if you can get someone to pay you $1,000 a page view, and, that, and you get like five page views a week, and you're running fine on our servers, that money's all yours and you never owe us anything. Okay? 
which is also great for startups, right? Like if you want to actually show a prototype of something, you can actually build it and show it rather than saying I need money because I've got these really awesome slides, right? Um, it's auto scaling and that's what we're going to show today. So I'm going to skip that whole point. Simple pricing, the pricing page is we only meter on uh, memory and disk space, no other metering. And we're coming out of developer preview this summer. Okay, that's it. Now when you say coming out of developer preview this summer, that means you're not quite there yet? We have people running their business on us already. It's just that we, we are actually still actively developing. And by the end of the summer, we will not be as active in our trajectory of development. Okay? We have people, it depends on how risk adverse you are, right? If it's just like your home, your, we have people who run their own WordPress sites on us, no problem. We have people who run their whole business on us. They're not that risk adverse. They are not that risk adverse, right? And so they have no problem with it. We go down for 15, 20 minutes. They're like, yeah, I don't care. One and one goes down all the time for me, so I don't care, right? The ladder to my base computer on my server. Yeah, right. The uh, last public number we released was, uh, we've been developing preview about a year and a half, and we have about 250,000 people using it for real Right. Is Redshift part oh. of Red Hat? No, they, they, they named it that after us. After we said we were OpenShift, stupid Amazon. So Redshift is their slow backup service that they have. Has nothing to do with us. I'm suing them. <laughs> okay, so scaling. This is more amorphous stuff. I tried to like find a good graphic that would talk about scaling. And since it's such this wishy-washy thing that everybody loves to talk about, but no one really does concretely, the best image that came up was Moby Dick. And I thought it was really cool, so I put it up. That's it. So I mean, scaling has a lot of different definitions from a lot of different people. And so I, I don't, I'm going to talk about one way in which you can think about scaling today. And this is mostly what web scale usually refers to. Have you guys seen that video for web scale? No? With MongoDB? All right, I'm not going to talk about it too much. If you want, it's not safe for work, so it's up to you if you want it or not. But the two types of scaling I'm going to talk about are vertical versus horizontal. Right? So vertical scaling is bigger, stronger, faster. Right? So you're running an Oracle database. You're not, run, you're not getting enough memory. You, you need more memory. You throw it on a bigger server. Right? You add more RAM to your server. You drop another CPU in the socket. You add a... a you add a, a SAN array for more disk space, right? That is vertical scaling, right? Horizontal is swarm baby swarm, right? That's like Google. Like you just keep adding more things. So this is vertical scaling, right? You just make something bigger. And the problem that happens is eventually you run out of being able to make something bigger sometimes, right? But there's a, the nice part about this is you can tightly couple things and make them bigger. Right, like you know, if I increase more CPU, I, there's a pretty linear relationship about what's going to happen. Or there's a tight coupling because it's on the same server. <coughs> this is horizontal scaling, right? Cheap, irreplaceable parts, and you overwhelm whatever's coming at you just by adding more. And if you lose one, it's not that big a deal. So, any questions on horizontal versus vertical scaling? I would imagine most of us at this point have been taught to be vertical scalers. Have any of you done any real horizontal scaling yet? No, right? The, the usual answer, at least back when I was growing up as a developer, was throw a bigger machine at it, right? Isn't that what most of you guys do when you get a problem? Bigger machine, bigger machine. That's changing. Yeah, a bigger, faster machine, right? I need more CPU. I need the latest CPU. Throw another 16 gigs of RAM at it. That's changing, right? With commodity hardware and everything. So today we're going to show horizontal scaling and how you can do it. So what you need for horizontal... <coughs> What you need for horizontal scaling is commodity hardware. And the reason I put hardware in quotes is, does EC2 actually give you hardware? They give you virtual machines, right? This, this hardware can be real. It can actually be a VM. But you need the ability to get, cheaply get another piece of your compute or memory unit. Right? That's, and that's recent. Right? The other reason we used to vertically scale is because machines were what? Expensive. They were like a huge cost. I remember... Back in the day, when I got my first terabyte RAID array, it was $10,000 for a terabyte of disk in RAID. And now you can just go to the... Would you guys have fries here? No. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So you can just go to Best Buy, though, and get two terabytes RAIDed array on a U external USB, right? So hardware is cheap now, which is recent. There has to be an ease of creation and deletion of that hardware. 
Right? It used to be really, with virtual machines and virtual hardware, it's very easy to rack and stack. You just spin another one up. Right? You don't send anyone out to the data center. You don't actually have to like, plug in all the network pieces. It's just there. So it's very easy to create and delete whatever you, cr whatever you make. Before, it was a real big sunk cost. Like Once you bought a $30,000 machine, you're not deleting that machine. Right? So that tended to lead to vertical scaling as well. And then you also need software built to grow sideways. Most of the software that we used to use and still use to this day is, used, is built for growing vertically, like really tightly coupled. And so new, more software now is being built to grow sideways. So I'm going to talk about OpenShift architecture just because if you don't understand this, you won't understand the rest of the part about scaling. So now I'm going to actually talk about how we do scaling. And how we basically do scaling is how you should think about scaling your apps whether you use a platform or as a service or not. And if you are going to use a platform as a service, almost all of them do scaling, like Heroku does as well. You need to build, kind of when, when you would build in the vertical scaling way, you would think about, oh, I'm going to get more RAM. So I'm going to increase the heap size. Right? That's what I'll do. I'll just increase the heap size and I'll chew memory. So when you build your app, you still do need to think somewhat about your hardware. right? You can't just say, it's going on a generic machine. So understanding scaling, will help you, how, we, how the hardware does it under the hoods will help you design your software. So before I go on, is there any other questions? Anything on vertical scaling versus hard, I'm just that good, huh? Yeah. Well, well, if you go wide, but if all your ants have to talk to the same database in a communication network, yep. then you, that's the problem, right? Is your database is the vertical scale, but your ants can't get into bigger than the database. That's right, that's like the hole to get into the mount, right? right? You can only pour so many ants out of the hole, right. even if you have a bazillion of them. And right. One of the reasons why NoSQL is coming, right? Because traditional relational databases are very hard to scale out horizontally like that. Like one of the last database implementations I actually did was a Oracle rack implementation and it was uh, about three million dollars for, for two servers at some measures way. But then you know things like MongoDB and Redis and, and things like that are designed with sharding so you can spread the database out over 20, 30 million of these algorithms. That's right. So we don't, I'll show that we don't actually have scaling at the database tier. We'll have it by the end of the year, specifically with Mongo, most likely. Because we usually what happens with the SQL databases is you have to make a replica, you have to do a replication. And with SQL databases, it's usually very intensive to set up replication. It's not just like a, a switch and suddenly replication happens. With Mongo, which I'm going to be using in this example, but not in a replicated manner, it's like one command and the database knows how to set, start replicating and sharding itself out. Like you basically just set up another Mongo instance, one command, and it finds it, does it, and starts sharding out. And so that's what you actually do. I mean, and the other thing is, and I, I didn't say this in the slide, and I'll probably add another slide on this, I think your scaling strategy depends a lot on what you're trying to do. Right? I don't want my bank horizontally scaling with a NoSQL database, right? Because transactions really matter to me in a bank. If, that, if, if you don't deposit my money, I want you to roll back and tell me you didn't deposit my money, and I don't want to wait for eventual consistency. But when I'm checking into Foursquare, I could give, who cares? If you miss my one Foursquare, unless I'm gonna be the mayor of something, then I really care. But if I'm not gonna be the mayor, I don't care, and so I'm fine with you returning to me really quick. I don't wanna wait for my Foursquare check-in for a long time. Right? So I think one of the other things you need to think about in terms of your scaling strategy is what is your app doing? Does, does each individual transaction matter a lot? And if it does, does speed still matter as well? Or is the user able to wait? And so that can also depend on whether you're going to go vertical or horizontal. <coughs> like it's the same thing with Google, right? Their search results. If, your search, if one person's mis search results misfires, it's not that big a deal. So that's why they can build farms upon farms, and oh yeah, that one hit didn't hit. They'll just redo their search, right? So, all right, so any other questions? He already got his USB key. I got like, look. I got a whole stack of them and there's no questions. Once everyone's got one, they still have one. Right. All right, I'm just that good. All right, so here's the, I'm gonna, this is a very high level overview of OpenShift. High, very high. We have a broker. When you send a command to spin up an app, it goes to the broker. The broker then says, Node, I need an app. What we do is we slice up a Linux... It's really disconcerting to have that jumping like that. 
Okay, just give me to breathe for a second. Okay, when we, we slice up all these nodes, these Red Hat Enterprise Linux nodes, we have like a couple thousand of these running in Amazon right now. And when the request comes in the broker, we slice them up and create a gear for your app. Remember I said the gear is like your server? And then what we do is we put cartridges on it. So like in this case, we put MySQL and JBoss on this one, right? And then you can interact through the bro through, either through the broker to make the initial request, and then all the rest of the commands come straight to the node. Right, so there's all the, rec like every web request comes into the node when someone's hitting the app, and any command, like when you do a git push or an SSH in, it comes directly to the node, to the gear that you have. Okay, so the broker's only here just for infrastructure things, like spinning up infrastructure. This is what we call an embedded app, non-scaling. We've put MySQL and JBoss into the same gear. Right, and this is more like your traditional, like I've got one app server, and I'm putting my SQL database and JBoss on top of that, right? And they're tightly coupled. If I, I can also create an app <coughs> with a. Well, Apache's not on that gear. If if you were running a, I'll have to go into more architecture. Let me do your Apache case. If this was Apache, if this was uh, Perl, uh -huh. this would be Apache with mod Perl uh -huh. plus my SQL. Oh, right. Yeah, that's what you need. I'm not, are you happy now? Thanks. Okay, good. Because it's all about you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> if we were to start up our app with a scaling flag to say that I want this to be a scalable app, each, this actually lives on this first one, HA proxy will live on this gear. That's our load balancer, right? And we'll start up one gear with, mod, with Apache and Mod Perl and your code on that one gear. But this gear is what's inside of what's called a gear group, right? And your database will be in another gear group. And so then what happens is you can say, I want this gear group to scale from one to 30, right? And so what'll happen is your web request will come into this gear. It'll say, uh oh, I'm starting to pile up connections. We'll pick up on the pile up of connections We'll automatically spin up another gear with the exact same architecture, R sync all the contents of this gear over to this gear, and then plug it this gear into the HA proxy automatically. Right? And then start using session affinity. So if there's already a session on this one, we're not going to move it over to the next gear. But if there's a new request that comes in, we're going to move it over to the next gear and start bleeding session and uh, bleeding requests over to the next one. Okay? We'll keep that up. We, then we have like a, a math algorithm that we use to look at how much this is being used. If you keep getting more requests, so you just launched your app on the App Store and you're getting slammed, right? Everybody's using your application now. It's like the best application ever. We'll keep watching and we'll keep doing that same operation over and over again. It's the next day. You're no longer the number one app on the App Store. You're not getting slammed as much anymore. <coughs> Actually, we wait every 20 minutes and we check because you've already paid for your hour of another gear. After 20 minutes, we say, oh look, you're not really using it. We'll spin it down for you. Bleed connections off, right? So if there's a session still talking to this gear, we'll wait until that session's done, and then we'll just shut down the gear for you without you having to do anything. Okay? So can you get all that with the free thing that you start You can do, because we give you three gears, okay. this plus this is one gear, okay. this is another gear, okay. you can scale up to two. Okay, you can try it in the free. So practically, the second gear that you spin up can be anywhere then? I mean, it's not reserved for you as part of the gear group? Nope. So, so the gear group really is just your max limit? It's a way to manage like, because you could say, I want this one to scale from one to two, okay. even though you wouldn't want to because we don't do replication. But let's just say, yep. you could say, I want this to scale from one to two, but I want this to go from one to 10. It's just a way of being able to say, this cartridge that I'm using, this piece of functionality, can scale this much, while this one can scale. It's a way for man, a gear group is like a, man, it's like a, a management concept, not a physical infrastructure concept. One of the really cool things we're working on that should be out pretty soon is the ability for you to set rules on your gear group and where to scale. So if you wanted to scale out to the Ireland data center, you can scale up there, plus you can scale over to Google Compute Cloud, plus you can scale your open stack so you can be able to scale to as many data centers as you want. Right. And the other reason why this would be good for enterprise, like remember I said we had that enterprise product? The, the other, what you can do with the enterprise product is bring this whole thing in-house and that would allow for cloud bursting. Right, so you could have an Amazon VPC 
and you could say, I want to start this up internally on my own infrastructure, but if it goes above this, I want you to burst the rest to an Am my Amazon VPC. Right? So it gives you all sorts of flexibility around that. So that would give you geographic scaling there. So like a CDN, you could push your nodes out to closest to you. Yeah, because today you don't really have control over where that scaled gear is going to reside, right. other than it's going to be in the same data center. It'll be, it'll, and it'll be on a different node. Yeah. Like we've, right. so, it, oh, so it'll be, so if one, no, if one of our big rel instances goes down, you'll have another one up. So the other thing you can do is you can also set the min minimum number to be three. Right, so if you wanted to really ensure high availability, you could say always start up with at least three gears. And then scale up from there. So what I'm would you, what would your HA proxy run then if your load yeah. balancer if that was on? Because if that was on this one. You want to talk about the what we're doing with HA proxy? The big problem with this today is there's a single point of failure. Yeah. And that's HA proxy. Yeah. And so we're fixing that and it'll be done next month. And so we'll have highly available HA proxies. And so you can have as many of those as you want. Yeah, you can imagine when we went to our enterprise customer, because enterprise already general availability. That's been for sale for six months now almost. And as soon as we went to any of the enterprise customers, every single one went, that's a single point of failure. That's a single point of failure. So that's been on the, <laughs> yes. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious. And so that was the fir one of the first things that was going into the, we had to fix that right away. So, so does everybody understand how scaling kind of works? So oh, question. New question from a new person. Oh, and you asked a question. That was your first one. Good. I don't want to get yelled at by Grant again. It does, there's no stupid questions. If I, if I wanted to do replication, could I look up and Manually, yes, but it's a bit of work, right? I mean, you're losing the benefit of the paths. Um, because you'd have to, we open up some of the ports, but you'd have to like write the scripts that set up all the replication, act the extra gears. It becomes that you're managing it more like infrastructure. Um, we have a partnership with Mongo Labs, and they do replication, right? So if you really want replication with Mongo now, and you're willing to pay, you can use Mongo Labs as the data tier, and then just use us for the scaling at this tier. Yeah. Oh, new question. Go ahead. And that's the only reason I'm asking. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> database replication. I mean, is that part of your development plan? Yes. Um, the part, the, you know, the thing is, we're polyglot. There's another term you learn. How many of you have heard polyglot before? Oh. Well, so polyglot means you do lots of different languages, right? We're a polyglot platform, and we're polyglot for data stores. And it's really hard to manage all of that ourselves. So Mongo Labs, for example, we've done for Mongo. Tengen is our, one of our really big partners, the people who make Mongo. They'll probably be taking over our Mongo cartridge and doing that. And we're working on a uh, relationship with Enterprise DB right now. So you could do a MySQL replicated instance through Mongo Labs? No. You, could pro what you'll, you can do a Mongo replicated yeah, set. Yeah, if you wanted to do MySQL, th that should be coming through our Enterprise DB partnership. And then we'll see how we... Uh, I mean, this space is new. Platform as a service is, besides Heroku, but as a big thing, is probably about a year and a half to two years old. Yeah. Right, so we're feeling out what's going to happen down at this tier. We'll always have the free tier with a single cartridge, maybe without replication. Over time, we may do our own solution for replication, or maybe like it's Enterprise DB. You want to use Enterprise, like if you want replication at this tier, strike up a relationship with Enterprise DB. The cartridge will be in our thing. We'll have a cartridge for it, but you may have to pay like a, doll, a, a penny an hour extra to Enterprise DB to get replication features. Like that's how it is with our Zen server. But if one you, way or another, whether it's through a partner or whether <coughs> whether Tengen, MongoDB does it themselves or whether we do it, it'll be there this year. So because it, that's the other thing that everybody says, right? What's wrong with this picture for horizontal scaling, right? This is the only piece that scales right now. So you can't really say, oh yeah, we totally auto scale and then only have auto scaling at this tier, right? So we know that's another thing. Now you see why we're also in developer preview, right? I mean, part of what we didn't want to do is pull a, a Google App Engine, which was, oh, look at our great cloud features, and it's this price. Oh, never mind, that was way too cheap. Here's the price, and it's three times the price of what it was before. So we'd rather go slow and conservative, and what we release, and real beta, not like we're in beta for five years, but like a real slow beta, and then actually when we release it, be solid about what we released. Does that answer your question? Yes. And that wasn't a dumb question. That was totally, it, don't say that when you say it was just for the USB key. That makes me feel like I'm just being used. Any other questions? Yeah. I just, uh, random curiosity question, are you using um, 
That's a fantastic question, which I can't. What time? What are, how are we doing on time? Twenty minutes. Oh, so I can't go into it too much here. But if you come to the session this afternoon, where we're actually all going to build apps using OpenShift, um, we are not using Linux containers. We're using SC Linux and C groups. We are investing. We, we have beat both the people Red Hat. The people who work at Red Hat are the people who do SE Linux and the lead contributors for Linux containers. Right? So we know what's happening with Linux containers. We just don't think they're ready yet for platform as a service. We're actively investigating them now. But, and so they may be coming, but we're just using SE Linux and C groups for most of our virtual... We don't do virtual machines. I mean, we, our RHEL instances are big virtual machines, but Gears are not virtual machines. So just to add a little bit to that, we firmly <coughs> So we are pushing a lot of changes upstream to create a new project called Secure LXC, uh, which is take, taking off the ground. And that'll probably first ship um, in about another year and a half to two years. We'll have a new project called Secure LXC. So is Dan Walsh going to be working on Dan Walsh works with us on our team, mm -hmm. um, and he does all the security work. Right, so if you went to our OpenShift Community Day, which was part of OpenStack Day, it was the day before OpenStack, okay. um, Dan Walsh gave a talk on SE Linux and our stuff. And SE Linux, that's not Red Hat? It is. Well, well it's, it's an open source project. But no one uses it except for us. <laughs> no, we were, we were, Red Hat was the one who drove through a contract with NSA, drove putting that into the Linux kernel. But it's oh, and SC is the secure one. Yes, SC Linux is the oh, SC Linux is the secure Linux, like the whole the one that everybody on their desktop machine turns off immediately, right? Because all it does is stop you from doing anything you really want to do on a desktop machine. Okay. But for servers, it's awesome, and I love having my servers have it, especially when Dan Walsh is the one who's making the rules, right? But on my desktop, I want nothing to do with it because it just stops me. Yeah. Can I create uh, new types of uh, gears? Uh, I can create uh, a gear with main cache. Yes, that's called right now. It's through a DIY, uh, do-it-yourself cartridge. <coughs> One of the other things that we have we've been working on really furiously is a new version of our cartridge specification. So by the summer, which will be landing in our summer. See you distracted, and now I'm going to run out of time. We're going to have the ability to use a Git repo and just pull from a Git repo and run the, a new cartridge. Right, so wherever you want to build it, you can pull it and run it inside of our space. And the problem with DIYs right now is they don't understand this. Because we don't know what you did inside of the do-it-yourself. You built your own cartridge, you might have built memcache, but we have no idea how to auto-scale that. With a new cartridge specification where it's easier to build cartridges, it'll understand this. Okay? No more questions. Otherwise we won't get a demo. And then it'll be all about slides, and I hate that. Is that okay? Well, you can really you can ask a question, but it better be a good one. All right, so that's it. Let's do it. No more slides. Ready? Well, maybe one more. Today, I'm going to take a GitHub repo I made for a single app. Right. So I love spatial applications. That's my background. So I, originally, to learn Mongo and some Python, I built a little uh, REST web service. So you put a request in, and I'm going to return some JSON about the national parks in the United States. Put it into Mongo. And I loaded it up. And this is what the app looks like. <coughs> That's not what I want. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the app. See? It's running on OpenShift right now. You need to take some UI classes. That like good app. <laughs> okay, so here's a big debate between Grant and myself. <coughs> Grant loves PHP. Grant loves templating. He loves writing server-side HTML. And Steve has a PhD in ecology, so he only cares about this type of thing. No. I am a firm believer that server-side developers don't know how to do UI. <laughs> but client-side developers do. Server-side developers know how to create data and do things with data, and that's all they should do. So I, be I love single-page apps with REST services. I hate server-side templating. So Grant's going to harass me. But this is a REST service that you can write a web page against or a mobile app against, and it doesn't matter. I, as the server developer, don't care. You can write whatever you want, and I don't have to try to widget HTML using all sorts of weird cryptic tags. Grant. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the here is a REST service where I ask for the web services parks, and it gives back all the parks, right? And it's a bunch of JSON documents, and each document has an ID. 
a name, Allegheny Portage Railroad, and a position, which is a Latin long. Right? So this is a simple REST service. The code is incredibly simple. You can actually get it on uh, GitHub. It's in our OpenShift repo. It's the OpenShift Mongo Flask example. And basically, if I go in here, I think Python's pretty easy to read. That request that we were just looking at, does it, <coughs> Flask is like one of those, <coughs> for those of you who've used JEE, it's like JAXRS. Have any of you used JAXRS? Yeah, isn't it awesome? Yeah, so this is just, or uh, Sinatra does the exact same thing. It's basically URL templating. Let me just make this a little bigger. We say anything that comes in for slash, slash WS slash parks, use this function. Make a Mongo connection, do a query, dump some JSON. That's all it took to make that one query. Okay, so it's a simple app because it's a REST service. Does it use sessions? No. There's no sessions in this, right? You basically request a resource and I give you back data. I'm not going to do this. So this is a great app for scaling. Sessions will kill your ability to scale. Right? Because then I can't each it's not like a bunch of ants. Right? Then you have sumo wrestlers because that sumo wrestler has to remember the session. And so you can't just say, oh, well, that ant died. I'll put another ant in the situation. Because the session lived with the ant. So you need to do sumo wrestlers when you do s sessions. Okay? So that's the return that we get. We, here's another one where I'm doing a near. If you, look at the, if you can kind of see the URL, even though it's in light gray, <coughs> it's asking for a Latin long. Right? And then it returns results based on what's close to that Latin long. So that's my entire service. When I created it, this is what it usually takes to create it. If I was, can you guys see that? Is that too big in the back? Too big. Is that better? In the back? Okay. So usually I would create that app like this, RHC app, create. That's it. No, usually if it's embedded mode, I haven't gotten to scaling yet. You, give me your key back. <laughs> so that's it. This is, why, this is why I call it awesome sauce, right? So I did all that talky, talky, talky. But as a developer, that's it. And within a minute, I will actually have an app up and running. Do you want to see it? We have a minute, right? Let me just call it something else other than Python WS because I may already have that name there. How's that? Okay? There's too many Mongos. There. It'll get, that'll be enough. That's it. That's the only command I need now to spin up. It's spinning up Apache for me. It's spinning up um, mod WSGI, putting that in my own Apache instance. It's also spinning up Mongo, <coughs> making my, an own MongoD instance for me, creating the database for it, getting it all set up putting environment variables into my environment. It's creating a Git repository on my gear. And then it's, it's going to eventually clone that back down to my machine. Right? So imagine, at the time I hit that command, you're looking through your directory to try to find your enterprise admin who's going to give you a machine. Have you found that phone number yet? No. You're still looking. Oh, you found the number. You call. Are they there? No. Or are they playing a game, right? So this is what's actually happening here. What we're doing behind the scenes also is we're going to be putting DNS in the place. It's slow. Why is it slow this weekend? It's because I'm doing a demo, and I lose points for that. While we're waiting, do you want me to skip on to the next part while we're waiting for that to spin up? Yeah. How many machines is it spinning up? One. One gear. One. Not a machine, a gear. Right? We have a big Red Hat Enterprise Linux machine, and on that machine, it's spinning up one gear right now. Because I did this in embedded mode. It's putting them both on. Part of the reason why it's taking longer is because I'm also spinning up Python and Mongo at the same time. There, it's done. So that's it. It's all set to go. And now it wants to, it's just asking, can I do an SSH key? And I say yes. It's doing a git clone now, and we're done. So in that amount of time, 
which actually is still relatively short if you think about how long it takes for a sysadmin to spin something up for you. This app is now live. As long as the DNS is, as long as the DNS is propagated to your phone, you can actually look at this app on your phone. There's the website, up and running, with code. Right? So you can start making changes, there's a database there, you can log in, all of that. And it's just as easy to delete it. And I can SSH in, but I'm not doing that now. Because today's scaling. If you want to do this yourself, or you want to learn how to do it, and see all the other steps, come to the workshop this afternoon. Okay? The, to make that a scalable app, <coughs> to make that a scalable app, all I had to do to this was do that. Oh, you can't see that at the bottom. That flag right there says, make everything on its own gear group. Okay, so that's what I did when I created my app. We good? So the, as a default then, what would that look like back in the other picture? As a minimum number of years? In the, as a default, well, let me show you. Okay, right, so here's the name of my app, Pscale. <coughs> Right? My name of my app is Pscale. If I do this, it's got MongoDB on one gear. It's, got, it's using two gears total. MongoDB is on one of those gears. Python 2.6 with HAProxy is on another one of those gears. So you have four gears. No, I have two. So the two, this, is the, this, is, this is information about the entire app up here. This is information about my MongoDB gear. It's taking up one small, so 512 megs of RAM. Mm -hmm. Here's the username and password, right? Here's my Python piece. Mm -hmm. It's using one gear. It can go, I have not set a limit for scaling, so it will chew as many gears as I have available in that account if I try to scale it. And they're small gears, and my HA proxy's on the same gear as my Python 2.6, okay? okay? One thing to know starting next month, we're going to change this to where if you start playing around with it, every app you create will be scaled by default unless you specify not to Right. I mean, because in certain ways, this is much cleaner, right? Every gear gets its own cartridge. If I had made this embedded, that 512 megs of RAM would be a, com a competition between Mongo and Python. They'd both be competing for those 512 megs of RAM. All right. So I've done all that. The app is up and running. Now I'm going to take um, Blaze Meter. Have any of you heard of Blaze Meter? No, or test, what's the other one? Tri Blitz, I Blitz IO. These are web services that you can pay for. In this case, they actually have a really nice free tier, which is 10, up to 10 hours a month of testing. And it will produce a JMeter, which is a Java-based load test script, and run it for you. Ready? So we're now going to start hitting that app. And what we're going to hit it with is this script. I gave it four different um, URLs to hit. It's going to do two second delay between requests up to 50 users. And the scenario I'm doing is extreme stress, which is we launched on the App Store and we were huge right away. So it's going to spike right away in terms of the number of requests it's going to hit. Okay? And so I start my script. And it's going to turn. <coughs> What? <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions about what's happening here? Because it takes a little while for it to start up. Here you can see what it's doing. Right? I've already run this script yesterday just to make sure it works. Let's hope sure it works again today. The other thing that we can look at for our app, I don't want this page anymore, is you can look at the HA proxy page for our application. Right? This is the, remember there was that HA proxy on that one gear? This is the this is the web gear. This is the web gear right here. This one's for the database. But I'm not seeing any requests yet. So let's hit it once with this one. And we should see at least Where's my HA proxy? Is that it? There. So there's the one session, right? We now have to wait for this part. 
to go. So while we're waiting for this, is there any questions? This is the part that I can't control as much. This isn't my service. Yeah? So just make sure I heard you correctly earlier. So in general, uh, you can't really scale with, when you're dealing with using sessions. So say that you're doing like some sort of uh, social application, would you suggest not building something like that on the service? Well, no, you could, right? I mean, I think even uh, it just becomes a harder scaling qu problem to do the sessions. And a lot of those, what you'll see with a lot of the newer apps. Unless you're using J yeah, but the other thing with a lot of them will do is they will keep session state on the client side. Right? So the client will remember what it's asking for and what it wants to know. And then what it'll usually do is cache data on the client. Because especially on mobile applications, opening and serving a request is actually really, really expensive. It's actually more expensive than streaming down the data probably. So mobile is very expensive to open up an, a connection. So what they'll do is they'll make a, that's why Mongo, well, we can talk more about Mongo later. It's a document store. And so what it does is you can actually store like the user and all their check-ins in one document. And so what you'll do is you'll say, I want all the check-ins now. And it'll return all of it so you don't have to go back and do joins and do all the other requests. So if you're going to move to like a social application, you start to move stuff into session on the client. Like they'll, rem they'll pass something in to remember where they want to go in the REST request. It won't live on the server. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, so let's see. Is it running yet? Okay, so it's starting to do requests. So we should see. Okay, so the line I'm looking at is here. All right, we've got two, we're at the limit. We haven't scaled up another one yet. We've we're turned about eight megs so far. Should I make it bigger? Is that better? Keep your eyes on. Can you in the back? Can you see down here? Yeah. Okay. So you can see, right? We're actually we've we've returned 431 requests so far. So that also should give you an idea about how much one gear can handle. That's actually pretty good. Like, if you're actually getting that many requests as a startup or as your own site, that's actually pretty a lot of load. Yeah, here's what's happening in the browser. This is that same thing. There was no, there was no wait. Did you see it happen? Want to see it again? Ready? Can you hear me now? Can you exactly? Here, I'll change the latitude and longitude just so that you know that it's actually something different. There, right? That wasn't cached. That was another request. Those requests you were looking at on the stats were they concurrent requests, or well, since you started this chip? Since I started. Yeah. There, we've now scaled up. See it? How many sysadmins did I call? How many times did my beeper go off? Zero, right? So I built a scalable app. It's auto scaling itself right now. It's spun up a new instance. It's already starting serving requests from it. It'll keep going. We, yesterday we got it up to what, like five grant? Yeah. There's another one. Oh no, that, what it has done, <coughs> it shut it down because it's R syncing the content over now. Sorry, it hasn't, these were requests right here. <coughs> you got water up here. Yeah, I know, I got a huge bottle of water too, right? Um, the, these requ the first requests were just the HA proxy saying, are you alive? It shut it down for a second, take it out of commission, and now brought it back in. It had to R-sync the content over. Oh, okay. Right, now the content's R-synced. So yes. So I'm gonna do some more slides and we'll come back. I'm wrapping up, is what I'm doing. But I'm gonna come back to this just before we finish so you can see how much we've actually started to hit. There's a whole bunch of lessons that come out of this. Also, notice that this URL is really weird. When we scale up, in a, in a cloud, well, I didn't put it in the slide. I'll, put it, I'll talk about it when I get to the slides. Okay? So scaling hints, avoid sessions. Loosely couple your pieces, right? So all the pieces of your application should be loosely coupled. This is why messaging queues have made a huge growth in terms of people using them. Because message queues, like, um, ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ, have you guys heard of those? 
right? Those basically allow you to loosely couple all your pieces because they're going to do all the message passing between your pieces. And they're also really good for retries and failures, right? Messaging queues knows, oh, I was supposed to send that message, it's down, I'm going to try another one, right? That's why uh, NBC frameworks become more prevalent as well. Right? Yeah, because you can, especially even server side, client side, all sorts of, because you can split out concerns and it's less cu tightly coupled. So that's, <coughs> those are the basic scaling hints I'm going to give for now. I mean, I think a lot of them come for depending upon your application. It's hard to do them general without knowing the specifics of your application. The wrapping it up is OpenShift makes life great for you. That's the propaganda one. Scaling can be easy if you do it from the beginning. Right, so if you design your app to be a sumo wrestler from the beginning, it becomes much harder to horizontally scale it later because you've tightly coupled everything. You get really nice predictability with that though, right? because you know it's all on one machine, you know you're not waiting for network, anything like that. So I want my banks paying $3 million to Oracle, well, or to Red Hat, well, Red Hat to run the OS and then whatever to Oracle to have that tightly coupled transactions, things are really performant. Everybody else, they shouldn't be doing sumo wrestlers as much anymore. Right? And then the last one is it's free. So give it a try. I mean, there's no, we only take an email address. That's it, if you want to try it out. Um, let's go back to our, that's it for this talk. Let's see how many we have going now. There, we've spun up another gear while we, I was talking. Right? So we're serving up more content now. And you'll see these will stay up for a while because as a user, I've already paid for those gears. So we're not going to like spin it up and spin it down and spin it up and spin it down. You've already paid. We might as well keep the capacity there for you in case more requests come in. Right? And so to get, it, to get a gear for an hour, what's that, 35 cents, $6? Dollars? <coughs> I'll show you the preliminary pricing that we announced. But no, let me just tell you this, that when we announce our availability pricing, it'll be less than what's here, okay? So it's right on the bottom right here. My picture was on there. That's why I scrolled through so fast. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the free tier. Right now, I know this number's coming down quite a bit, but you pay to get, it's like a bar tab. You pay, or a bar fee, you get paid to get in the bar, this will be, somewhere in the order of half that amount to get in. You get up, then you can start buying extra gears. A small gear right now is five cents an hour extra. You, get, you still get your three free, right? So even if you pay, you're not gonna pay for this one until you're using four small gears. And even the actual price of that small gear will be? Less, and so will the medium. And the medium is one gigabyte of RAM, okay? So, so on that, that she did, then what you're saying at the moment is you get three free years. Yep. And then between four and 16, is it 16 or 18? 16? Yep. 16. You're going to pay five cents an hour. For a small. <coughs> if, and for you. <coughs> excuse me. And only what you use. It's not like, right? So when that gear is up and running for an hour, you pay for it. So what's the. I think Grandma mentioned this yesterday. What's the what's the metric that tells you when you're going to spin up the next gear? Um, we look. I think it's more than five concurrent HTTP connections per minute, or less. I think it might be. If we if we just see five piling up, we spin up, right? That's a, well, there's a certain amount of time we wait. Yeah, what we actually do is we look at your HTTP request every 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. If you have more than five concurrent requests. And waiting to serve it, um, that's when we spin up a new one. Okay? We then re examine your traffic every 20 seconds. If you don't have five concurrent requests, you have a threshold to keep those gears around to make sure that you don't see another spike. Right. And that's like for 20 minutes or something like that. Um, and we'll start down again. Down. Right. So if we consistently see, and that also gives us time to bleed the connection off, right? right? To say, oh yeah, th we can stop sending sessions to that one that's not being used. Yeah, could you? go up to 20 concurrent requests probably, but we wanted to be very conservative with mm -hmm. scaling to make sure that if you need to scale up, that we're doing it proactively based on demand. The last thing you want is if you get a lot of traffic suddenly coming to your site, be unresponsive. Because that means probably that you're on a news article or you got featured on an app store or slashed out it or something. Well, so right. in the, and, and at the point of time, which I think you said was the end of summer, where you're going to 
potentially spin up an instance in another data center geographically, this one is going to take time, yeah. right? And so as a user, obviously, as you're paying for this, and then it'll be two, three, four cents, whatever it is per hour, um, we're going to give you a lot of control over how uh, much you can scale up. Maybe your budget is $20 a month, and mm -hmm. so that means you can only scale up for four years at any point in time. You can set those back. That's right. right. But you just scaled up. Yeah, it's scaled up again. Mm -hmm. And you can see it actually doesn't take that long because what we're not because what we're not doing is spinning up a VM, right? If you think about it, all we've done is done another slice of a Linux machine, rsync the contents over, and that's it, right? So spin up for us is actually really relatively quick. In the, in the current situation, right? Once you start to uh, e even another data even in another data center, yep. what we would have is we'd already have the node sitting there. It's the same exact thing. It's just in a different data center. Right. So it should be it should be just as quick. And you've got the pipe. Right, the R sync would be the thing that would be expensive between the two data centers. So that's it. That's the scaling. And so, in the same way that we do this under the hoods, you should think about doing something similar in your apps, even if you don't use an auto scaling platform. All right. So I'm done. If there are other questions, go ahead. Um, uh, but you can leave if you want. And this afternoon, what we're going to be doing in here this afternoon in the same room, you need a laptop. Well, you don't need a laptop, but it'll be a lot more fun if you bring a laptop. Um, we're actually going to go through those, some of those same propaganda slides, but if it's all the same people, then I'm gonna go, I'll either skip them or go through them very fast. And then what we're going to do is spin up that exact same app that I just ran in an embedded mode, and you'll actually build it yourself. Okay? And we can do, you can do it in Python, Java, or Node.js this afternoon, if you want. Okay? That's it. Thanks.